Okay, everyone. Oh, wow, that's very loud. Okay. Yes, that's a combination of me being loud and the microphone, I guess. I'll hold it down here. So, thanks for coming. Um, I'm that guy, Jonathan. Um, I do some politics stuff. I'm kind of happy to be here again in Kiev. I attended various of the, the Palm Over events before, and it's really nice to, to be back here and to have Yapsi here. I like the city very much. So, uh, I'm, I'm happy we landed up here. So, what I'd like to talk about today is getting Recudo Pulse 6 onto the JVM. And this is something that I've been working on for the last around 10 months, along with others. So, just to sort of clear up what we're talking about here. <coughs> First of all, what is Recudo? Recudo is an implementation of Pulse 6. So, unlike in Pulse 5, where we have the one true implementation, um, and that kind of is the spec in Perl 6, we sort of split that up. So there's a language specification, along with it there's a test suite, which actually forms part of the specification. Um, it's kind of an executable spec. And essentially you're a Perl 6 implementation if you pass the test suite. And of course the test suite will evolve, and the spec evolves, and so forth. Um, but that means we're in a position to not just have you know, a single implementation of, of Perl 6, but it means we're in the place to to actually have multiple and then to be on different back ends. Um, so, Recudo is decidedly the most actively developed Pulse X implementation at the moment. I'd say that we have between 10 and 20 people directly contributing code each month, but um, if you go and actually look at the wider ecosystem and people doing modules, contributing tests, uh, contributing to the specification and things like that, um, it's actually quite a few more. So. Uh, it's had, we do, we do monthly releases, it's a very good development discipline to do that on a project, um, so we've been doing this. So, there's not really a sense of sort of core modules in Perl 6 either, so you may have heard of the Recudo staffing, um, that's what we call a distribution release. So we have compiler releases, which is just the core compiler, and then we also do distribution releases, that's what Recudo star is uh, about, and that's batteries included but we don't say that's the official one. Um, in fact, we, we very much hope to sort of have separate people worrying about that in the future. So that's what Recudo is. Um, so about the JVM. Stands for Java Virtual Machine, which kind of sounds like a scary starting point because, you know, with Perl folks, why this virtual machine built for Java? Um, but actually, there's a lot to like about it. There's plenty to dislike about it too, but there's quite a lot of things to like about it. Um, one of the things is that while when it first came out it was very slow, they've done an awful lot of optimization work over the years. It now has exceptionally good just-in-time compilation capabilities. Uh, it also has extremely stable, widely deployed, widely used threats. There's also loads of libraries and frameworks there as well, which can be kind of interesting. And one of the questions that might then come up is, well, isn't the JVM all about static languages? Uh, and, well, that's actually an interesting one to, to start talking about because Perl 6 is not really a dynamic language in the traditional sense. It's actually a gradually typed language. There's a type system and you can use it to the degree that you want, uh, or you can exploit it to the degree that you want. Uh, but actually, you know, it's, that's the way we are. Um, and what that means is that actually when you're implementing it, you actually have to take care of a bunch of statically typed things as well as all the dynamically typed things. So being on a VM that does just one of them really well is, is actually not quite the optimal. And in some senses, it can actually be easier to build the, the dynamic out of the static than to build the static out of the dynamic. And I've done it both way around. Um, I'm fairly comfortable to say, well, I think actually building the dynamic on the static is kind of easier uh, to do in a formal way. But because we have to do both, you can say, well, wouldn't it be nice if there were virtual machines that could do both? And then what actually happened is uh, CERN, now Oracle, hired the guys working on JRuby, the Ruby implementation on the Java virtual machine. And they said, we'll use these guys not just to develop JRuby, but to help us make the JVM better for other languages. And the one very concrete result of that is a new instruction in the JVM called Invoke Dynamic. Now, to call it a new instruction is actually kind of underestimating this thing. It's actually the gateway to a whole system of things that basically let you teach the JVM how your language works. 
So what does it mean to do type checking in this language? What does it mean to do dispatch in this language? That's actually really powerful because now we have a way to tell the JVM this bit of code over here is not actually the user's program. This is dispatch logic to do with our language. And you have a whole bunch of different combinators that you can put together and the JVM actually can understand what you're doing is essentially dispatch so it can then apply its various optimizations. So it's kind of important that not only here are we in a position to build the things we need on the JVM, we actually have a mechanism in the JVM now and that we can explain to it this is the way our language thinks. <coughs> so this is all kind of promising. Um, and you know, I, I think that isn't it a static language thing? Well, well no. Um, actually, these days it's, it's almost perfectly placed for being a gradually typed language VM because it's done the static stuff well for years and now they're putting stuff in to help cope with the more dynamic scenarios. So what languages run on the JVM today? Um, well, Java, the COBOL. Yeah, that's enterprise too, right? So, you know, it, it's obviously these, these very untrendy languages. There's no scripting lang- Oh, wait, yes, there is. JavaScript, Python, Ruby, Tickle, Lua. In fact, JavaScript, they're working on a, a compiler at the moment that will use all the invoked dynamic stuff, and they're hoping to actually be competitive with things like V8. That's their hope, and they'll get that, but they're trying. Um, so, guess what's not in the list? Where's Perl? Where's Perl? Who knows? Um, so, quite a while ago, um, way back, <laughs> Patrick Michaud, who is the, the Rakuto Pulse Expert King, uh, and Jesse Vincent, who was, even at the time, or I, I'm not sure exactly the chronology here, but he has been a Pulse Expert King. We sat on a, the bus somewhere, um, and we won't discuss the implications of bus number on this, but anyway, they were sat on a bus together uh, discussing uh, stuff, and the, the basic conclusion was, well, all the major scripting languages, except Perl, have implementations on the JVM and .NET. Uh, Perl 6 is probably Perl best, if not only hope, of actually getting onto the JVM and .NET and having a presence there. So the only way we're going to get there is probably through Perl 6. Okay. So why, you know, but even then, why care? I mean, why care about running on this virtual machine? And you know, Perl has already always been a run everywhere language. It's just that everywhere has changed. Once upon a time, that was primarily about physical platforms. It was about CPU and operating system combinations and trying to work on all of them. But today, a bunch of the interesting platforms are virtual. There are organizations who don't say, we're going to deploy on this CPU and with this kind of operating system. They say, no, we're going to deploy all of our things on the JVM, and if you want to use Scala, or you want to use Java, or you want to use Clojure, go ahead and do it so long as it deploys on the JVM. So if your language that you want to work in can't run there, well, you can't use it. That's the end of that. So it's kind of this motivation that you know, we need to sort of move beyond just thinking about platforms as being the physical things. We also had some other motivations to actually do this. And you know, one of the questions you might ask is, well, why not put this off further into the future? Uh, why not you know, try and get a really solid Pulsex implementation on one thing and then you know, some point way down the road <coughs> then think about doing the, the JVM backend? There's a few reasons. Uh, one is that we actually were hitting some problems getting to where we wanted with Pulsex with building it on the ParaPM. Now we're not dropping doing that. We're not you know, going to stop running on Parrot anytime in the immediate future. Um, but we were starting to run into a bunch of the limitations that it kind of had. And you know, really, um, one of them was that we, we really needed a better base to, to go and explore the whole parallel and asynchronous stuff. It's been one of the things that you know, people keep coming and saying, what's the Frederick story? Where's, where's the async stuff? And for ages, it's been like, uh, um, uh, I hope we'll get there. Um, and the answer now is, oh yeah, we actually can go and get that. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, the other thing is that the JVM, as I said, is very well tuned. And there's always been this challenge for us that because we, you know, we have Rakuto itself, which to some degree is an, you know, an unknown quantity in, in itself, and we had Parrot, which you know, again, we were the, the main or almost only customer of, 
So what happened is you then start getting the question, well, where exactly are the performance issues? Um, you know, is it, is it, should we pin it all on the VM being slow? Or is it that certain built-ins are slow? Or is it something else? So, you know, we had to, we've always had trouble answering that. Uh, and actually going and showing Recruiter onto another VM has actually sort of helped give us some answers. But also, because people run large, complicated things on JVMs today, there's profiling tools that we can use to help us understand that performance. So the question is how to get there. And, you know, originally, um, if you go and look at the way languages that are on the JVM, like Python and Ruby, have got there, well, they, just like Perl 5, started from having an original, official, if you like, perhaps, C implementation. And then the JRuby project was essentially a from scratch thing. <coughs> now, Perl 6 is kind of large. It's quite a big job to implement a Perl 6 compiler with all the built-ins and so on. You might have noticed it's taking a while. So, starting from scratch, that's kind of, you know, that's going to be very costly. Um, so, one of the sort of questions is, well, why not build one compiler that can actually target multiple parkends? Because there's plenty of precedent for this. I mean, if you take something like GCC, it's not tied to just spitting out code for an x86 processor. It can spit it out for all kinds of different architectures. So clearly there's precedent for doing that sort of stuff. So to actually explain that, I just need to take a little dig into what a compiler actually does on the inside. I'm not going to go and look at all the nasty goods. Okay, but basically, compilers are all about trees. Compilers love trees. The first thing a compiler does is take the program text and turn it from text into a tree. And this tree represents the source code of the program, roughly. And then it does magical stuff, and eventually out the other end comes another tree, which represents the code that we run on the target machine. And then finally we flatten that out into a bunch of bytes or text assembly language or something like that. So we get these names, uh, we call the bit up here the front end, we pull a bit down there the back end, and the front end is all about a specific language. So it's concerned with the language's syntax, the language's semantics, the language's declarations, type system, object system, and so forth. The back end is all about the target machine that we're going to run on, you know, Parrot or the JVM or something. So really, this is about mapping these high-level language concepts down to that runtime. So if you actually go and look at the Recruiter source code, what you actually find is that it's a, essentially a set of steps. In fact, they're all listed out somewhere. You can go and find a list. And basically what happens is you start off, and then you pass, and you build a tree that represents the program. And then that tree goes through an optimizer, which makes a nicer tree. And then that tree, in turn, is passed on to the, the back end, which turns it into a lower level tree, which then gets generated out to code. And each of these stages, and this is kind of important as a design principle for systems in general, is very, very isolated. They don't know about each other. The only thing that happens is you pass a very well-defined data structure between each one of them. That's actually a very good way to design systems in general, by the way. So, the most important tree that we have in the Recruiter compiler is called CAST. It's the, the Q abstract syntax tree. And if you want to know why the Q, um, I think Patrick Michaud is to blame. And we've made jokes about one day he'll morph into the superhero quantum Michaud. But I'm not actually sure why he likes the letter Q so much. Anyway, um, it end, it, it's also the letter after P, and I think that was the historical reason. Um, but basically, this is a data structure that represents your program. And I don't want to dig too much into it, but you know, I, I can sort of explain to you at least what happens if I write $x plus 1. Well, what happens is that we end up with an add instruction there. And this node in the tree has two children, and this one over here represents the variable x and this one over here represents the number one. 
And that's a simple example, but it basically all boils down to this sort of stuff. There's about 15 different load types. And when I first joined the project, it was like, no, that's never going to be enough. We're going to have to have loads more. And Patrick said, no, we won't. And I said, yes, we will. And he was right, because he's over here. So the overall sort of plan of attack then was to say, well, actually, um, the front end that takes the program source and builds this cast tree is not tied to any virtual machine in any way. Not really. And where it is, we can decouple it. That's just an, a failure to abstract the steps. So in theory, then, all we needed to do was write a thingy which could take one of these cast trees and turn it into JVM bytecode, and then we were done. Um, which is sort of simplifying things a bit, but basically that's it. So, one thing that you immediately then come to is you say, well, wait a minute. What about the compiler itself? Okay, because in Perl we have eval, and we have begin. So we can do runtime at compile time, and we can do compile time at runtime. So what that basically means is that if we were to be running you know, a Perl 6 implementation on, say, Parrot, and it was spitting out JVM bytecode, as soon as we hit an eval, oops. So you actually have to port the compiler as well. Now, thankfully, we'd actually written the compiler in NQP, which is not quite Perl 6, which is a sort of very pared down subset of Perl 6 that we believe we can optimize more easily, we can generate much more efficient code for much sooner without building really clever things. And NQP is actually written in itself. That sounds like a really weird thing, okay? but it actually works. What happens when we change it is we use the previous version of the compiler to build a new version. And we just keep around the copy of some base state, we call it stage zero, so what actually happens whenever you build, and if you've ever watched the NQP build, it's probably driven you mad because it looks like it does the same work three times, okay? What it does is it actually takes that safe copy, uses it to build a new NQP, and uses the new one it just built to then build another one, okay? So you're always running an NQP built with the same thing, um, and hopefully they will fall out the same. So if you actually look at the, you know, what we have in Rikudo, if you look at the source tree, um, you'll see that essentially in Rikudo itself, largely these are the bits we have. Um, the free on the left are all bits of the compiler, the grammar is about the syntax, the actions are about the semantics, the world is about the declarations. And then we have a bunch of meta objects. These are the things that say, how does a class work? How does a role work? How does a subset type work? Essentially, for each kind of type we have in the system, uh, there's a measure object that represents this. And they're factored very, very prettily using lots of different roles, uh, which is very, very nice. Um, so that's all written in NQP. And then we have the built-ins. We call it the core setting. This is the built-in types like int, num, string. Um, also, some more advanced things like hashes and lazy lists, arrays, all of these things. Date, time, okay, IO. So that's sort of the core built into library. So that uses NQP, which is also all written in NQP. And then underlying this, we have cast itself. And that actually is just a bunch of nodes. So that, that's easy enough to do in NQP itself. And then we also have a few things which sort of form a kind of VM abstraction layer. Um, so six model is a bunch of primitives used for building an object system. Essentially, it's the ingredients you need to make a system that does classes, that does roles, that does inheritance, that does composition, and all of those things. And it basically gives you the, the core building blocks you need to do that. And then we have a whole load of things we call NQP ops. It's actually a namespace <coughs> for operations that range from really simple things like add two numbers together all the way up to rather more involved things, right, run this finite automata and compute a list of trait places we should go while passing a grammar. Um, so they can be relatively complex. Essentially, they're things that either are fairly primitive to a VM itself, or they're doing something that needs to be performant, or they're doing something that is, is having to go and, and hook down into say, the operating system. And then beneath that, we just have the actual virtual machine 
layers themselves. So over here, we actually have, say, the Parrot VM, and above it, we have this, this Peart thing, which is a tree representation of the uh, Parrot bytecode. So the plan was we just add a JVM one down here. Okay, so those bits in red are the things that we'd actually have to implement from scratch. And I hope what you can sort of see from this, even if you don't quite follow the whole thing, is that most of the code in here, and most of the stuff in here, is things that we can actually reuse for the JVM implementation and the Parrot implementation and so forth. So we don't actually have a separate, you know, there's no repository that you can go to and this is the Rakuto on JVM repository. It's all in one repository with the special things just sectioned off into the odd directory. So how did this go? Well, basically this all started when I uh, figured it was time to actually work on this. And I quietly started building up something called JAST. Um, and this is sort of JVM abstract syntax tree. And basically the idea is that I got myself a way where I could write some code like this, which based is actually a test case. Okay, so what it does is it just makes a, a method object, it throws a few JVM opcodes in there, that's just returning the constant one. Okay, and, and then it, it then runs this, tries to exercise it using some Java code, um, and then make sure we get the correct thing out. So what I could do is actually get myself a way to talk about all of the things the JVM can do in terms of some, some MQP code. Now, of course, this had to be turned into Java bytecode at some point, and I really did not want to write a Java bytecode emitter. That's really boring. Okay, I just did not want to do that. Thankfully, there's libraries out there that can do it. So I didn't have to invent that part again. So at this point, this was probably around October, November. Um, I actually had sat on my laptop, on a programming machine at home, um, something that could actually take this things, trees I built in NQP and spit out a JVM bytecode file. Now, of course, um, that's not actually very useful yet. Okay, the next interesting bit is that you write something that takes a cast tree and turns it into one of these JAST trees. So this is the real compilation work. This is the interesting bit. This is where we're actually turning high-level language things that mean something in Perl 6 <coughs> into lower-level JVM instructions. I basically did that in a fairly test-driven way. I actually built a bunch of tests that were useful to us on other backends as well. So we've stolen a lot of them into the, the more VM project. Um, and basically, the test kind of looks like this. Okay, so here you can see we have a block. We then just do a say op near there. We have a string val. Okay, and we have a, a literal. And then all we do in this is we say, well, here's the main entry point, which actually ends up being the, the JVM main method um, of the, the bytecode file it produces, and we call this block up here, which then does the right work. And then we check that the output is that string. So essentially, that's, that's the way that all of this got built up. Uh, now, at some point just before Christmas, I actually pushed this all into a repository that people could see, and they all looked at it and were like, huh, huh, how do you do anything with this? Um, because at this point, I didn't actually have a way to run any actual code. Um, when you're a compiler writer, you're actually quite happy enough assembling trees and seeing they do the right thing. Um, so what I actually had to come next, of course, because I could turn all these complicated trees into JVM bytecode, but I couldn't actually compile any programs, was taking the NQP compiler which produces cast, taking the thing I had that could take a cast tree and turn it into JVM bytecode, and wiring them together. Now, that took 20 lines of code. That's an architecture win, okay? So basically, I wrote 20 lines of code, fiddled around a little bit, and now I could actually turn a whole bunch of NQP programs into JVM bytecode and run. So then it was a case of, okay, well, you know, we just need to keep going and implementing the missing pieces now, which we did. So what we really had was a cross compiler. Okay, and the way you do it is you run NQP on Parrot, it does the pass, and it spits out bytecode for the JVM. 
So at the end of this, what you then do once you've got this fairly capable is instead of just feeding it the, byte, the, the source code files for the test suite, you start feeding it the files for NQP itself. So this is really neat because you have an NQP running on Parrot attached to a backend which spits out JVM bytecode, and then you just give it itself. And you say, please take yourself and spit yourself out in JVM bytecode. And then you have a compiler which is self-hosting on the JVM and doesn't need Parrot. So then, of course, the question is, well, we have a standalone NQP on the JVM. So can that standalone NQP on JVM produce itself again? And the answer was not quite, but after some hacking, yes. Um, so at that point, um, we now had a, a sort of complete bootstrap standalone NQP sharing most of the source code with the, the Parrot version and running on the JVM. Question? Yes? What would you have done if we hadn't had Parrot? You have to sort of build NQP from scratch. Yeah, which is exactly why the very early NQPs were written in Parrot Intermediate Language. Oh, yes. If you remember all the way back, the very early NQPs were written in, in Parrot Assembly, which was maintainable as hell. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. Oh my word. So um, anyway, we got to this point. And actually, this, this all landed in late April, and it made it into the May release of NQP. Um, so NQP has been running on both since May. So of course, having got NQP done, you're like, yes, I got that. And then you realize you haven't got there at all, because what people really want is Recudo there, so they can run Felsex. OK, so here we go again. Well, it turns out um, that these are the components you have to worry about. So what you really need to do is get the compiler itself, which is written in NQP, to cross-compile over to the JVM. You need to get the meta objects and the type system bootstrap. And then you have all of the built-ins. Okay, so this is kind of what goes on. So you need to do these, and then this one at the top, and then finally you might have something that can deal with that one in the, the bottom right corner. Now, the really nice thing about this is that while the Perl6 grammar is a good bit more complicated than the AQP one, uh, it's still actually expressed using all the same primitives. So it's, it's, a, it's basically a really big version of NQP. It turns out it basically just worked. Um, we didn't actually really have to spend much time debugging problems, passing problems, with the Pulse 6 grammar on the JVM. It essentially worked straight off, which is very nice. The actions are actually even simpler, because all they're doing is taking match objects and building a cast tree. Okay, so that's, that's really naughty stuff. Um, the world was, was kind of a little bit more involved. Um, the meta objects, believe it or not, are also very simple because they're basically NQP code doing a bunch of method calls and then calling down to the odd primitive thing. So the, the heart of it was, well, some of the primitives are missing. So it didn't actually get hard and interesting until we get to the bootstrap. Now, the thing to know about the bootstrap is it basically is a huge chunk of code that wires together the Pel6 type system. So it basically establishes the real primitive built-in types that you actually can't even start compiling Perl 6 code with unless you have them in existence. So for example, okay, we just saw a literal string. Well, we need to turn that into a string constant, so we better have the string type around. So we can't actually go defining them all you know, straight off in Perl 6, so we need to piece a few of them together before we start. So that's what the bootstrap does. Now, if we did that every time at startup, it would be quite a lot of work. So what we actually have is a huge begin block in NQP, which builds the, the sort of fundamental base types of the Perl6 object system up. And then it says, there you go. And it shoves them in the export table for this module. OK, and that's it. And then we serialize all the objects that get created. So what actually happens is we don't ever have to run the bootstrap again. Um, once you've got a built Pel6, it just, just loads all the objects. Great. So that took some work, but we got there. So then we get to the buildings, the core setting. And that's the bit where it all gets really interesting, because if you've seen this thing, you'll know it's basically one huge file. In fact, it has about 13,000 lines of code, or it did. It has about 15,000 now, because IO spec came along, uh, and threading stuff came along, and other things came along. So 
one foot sort of thing you realize is the very first time we're going to test the Perl 6 compiler on JVM, we're going to feed it a file that's 13,250 <coughs> lines long. That's a pretty good first test for a compiler. Um, now, of course, it didn't work. Um, but I did actually decide at some point we'll just do it all in one go because some other things are related and we can get there. Now, getting from line 0 to 100 sort of took about a week. And people were teasing me very nicely about this progress and making estimates of me finishing in 2015 or something like that. Um, and then we sort of got from 100 to 1,000 in another week. And the prediction started to improve. Um, and it basically went sort of like that kind of curve because then 1,000 to 2,000 was a day. And then getting the rest of the way was basically another day. Um, so what's really going on at the start there is you, you sort of have all of these you know, very primitive things you're missing, and the further you go, the less you miss. Now, when we say compiling, I'm actually lying a little bit, because um, if you get to line 137, there's a begin block. What does a begin block do? It runs. So compiling the Perl 6 built-ins actually involves executing stuff. So we actually not only could get through this just by having a working compiler, we actually had to have working runtime as well uh, for simple code. Anyway, eventually, we got to the world, which was very nice. Um, and what was really nice about this is that basically we hadn't really cheated anywhere. This wasn't full of cheats all over the place. This was a very full blown um, with lots of stuff being built, Perl 6 implementation. Now, it was missing some important things. But essentially, from the start, it, it actually was you know, the full grammar. There was no missing bits of grammar or anything like that. Um, a few built-ins were commented out. Okay. So since then, we've been working pretty hard on this. Um, it's not just me, many others have contributed as well. At the moment, we're passing, the last number I saw when I was building this, was a couple of days ago, it may have shifted a little, was 99.28% of the same spec tests, specification test suite that we do on Parrot. So we... So yeah, that's, it's, it's pretty compatible. Um, we're chasing down some of the last things. Um, believe it or not, sockets are one of them, um, which will get us another bunch of tests. Binary I.O. is one, which I should do when I'm lazy. Uh, but I think you know um, this, this is looking very promising. So one question that comes up when I tell people about this is, um, now we can run Perl 6 on the JVM, can it call any of the Java class libraries? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, and the answer is, um, as of a few, about a month ago, Steph and Maria put in a bunch of the primitives for it, and in the last week I started putting together a sugar layer for this. So what we're doing here is we're taking the, uh, over here you can see this is the CRC32 class from the Java class library in the Java util zip package. And it's basically a use statement, but then on the end we put colon from Java. What that does is it goes off and the module loader says, wait a minute, you know, this isn't going to be a Perl 6 thing, it's a Java thing. Do I know a module loads and it can load Java code? Oh yes, I do. Okay, you can do it. So what we actually get back is essentially something we can just call new on like this, from our Perl 6 code. Now, one of the things and what I'm actually doing, by the way, is, is just encoding the string here into utf and looping over the bytes in it, okay? And then I'm calling the update method with each of the bytes, and then the end I'm saying get value. Now, the first thing you might be thinking is, what the heck is going on here? <laughs> Which is a very good question. Um, the answer is that Java methods can be statically overloaded, okay? So what actually happens is every method name can also have other methods that are the same short name but take different parameters. At the moment, if it's ambiguous on just the name, because they take different kinds of parameters, you actually have to spell it out. I'm currently halfway writing through something that attempts to do multiple dispatch over Java types, which is a minor headache, um, but I'm getting there. <laughs> so, <laughs> A minor headache to you is a major headache to anyone else. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. 
So um, you, we'll do better than this eventually. Um, this works today. Um, now I thought that that was sort of an okay demo. You know, I mean, I always like to do at least one demo at a talk, right? So we should probably do this. Okay. So. Um, oh, it's off screen. That's a real pity. Yeah, that's that's the CRC code. That's my redundancy check code of uh, the string hello world uh, encoded in UTF-8. I should understand that. Um, so the other thing I did was I said, well, wouldn't it be nice if I could actually sort of get a you know a graphical thing to pop up? So what I actually did um, was I went off and grabbed the the standard widget toolkit library SWT. Um, now the thing is that isn't built in. So then I realized, oh, it comes from a jar file. So what I did is I set up something like this. So I just declare a constant, which is the, the jar name. That's basically like a, a, a sort of, well, a bundle of different classes. Um, and what it then does is instead of just saying from Java, you tell it it comes from that jar file. Um, it might be nice if we can find a good way to factor this out at some point. Um, I'm thinking about it. Um, but what we then do is we pull in uh, SWT, a display, a shell, a text thingy, Okay, and then what we can do is we can actually just call a constructor on these various things. We can just set these up, we can put some text in there, we can pack it, and this will all look a lot nicer once we actually get through this nice little multi-dispatch thing we need to do, so you can just write the short name. So once we get done with that, um, then this will uh, sort of be nicer code, but it turns out that this does actually work today. So, and it's slow as heck uh, to get started. The, the thing that you'll very quickly see about the JVM port, and this is exceptionally slow because my laptop is, how, there we are, there we are, there's a window. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's, uh, it works. Um, so, oh, oh well, we had it. There we are, okay. So, that's, that's some basic testing. Um, you might wonder how far this can actually go. If you come to my talk tomorrow on the threading stuff, I won't show you this, but actually the threads implementation is built using this interop layer to delegate down to the JVM threading classes at low level. Um, so that's kind of nice. Um, we're working on making it really nice. Um, we'll get there. Um, but it's nice if there's something so far. Is it any faster? Um, startup time's awful. Um, we kind of knew it always would be. I think we can improve it somewhat from now. Um, we also have got uh, Stefan Maria built us an eval server, so it basically keeps a persistent JVM around um, and then just throws requests over to it um, and gets it to eval them. And it can do it multi-threaded as well and keep all the different bits isolated, so it's, it's really very nice. Um, but to put the performance in context, um, it's important to remember we've been working on this for about 10 months, okay? and we've been working on Recruiter on Parrot for quite a while. Once the JVM gets going, it actually tends to win. The most significant example is this blog post by Solomon, in which um, I don't have time to read it all, okay, but the key number is here. For his real world task, he was actually using this for part of his day job work. Um, he found that Recruiter on JVM, once it got going on a large workload, ran about 40 times faster which basically equated to the stuff getting done in 12 minutes rather than seven hours. Okay, that's quite a speed up. So it well, depends very much on workload, but it's very reassuring that for at least this one, it came out significantly better. Threading, yes, come to tomorrow's talk, same time, different room. Um, what next? Um, try and clean up the remaining failures. That's gonna be um, hopefully by the end of this month. And then we're going to be working on getting the module ecosystem done and running nicely and get a Recruiter star release out that's based on the JVM as well. Um, and hopefully that will be September, probably October. Um, it depends on how fast we type and how few problems we hit. Um, it's slow to start up. Um, there's some, some weaknesses, just to be fair. Okay, it's slow to start up. I've talked about that already. Um, the invoke dynamic thing is good news. However, its stability is um, interesting. Um, it's going to be much better in JDK 8 because they realized they basically did the first cut the wrong way. 
and then um, they sort of don't, had to do over. So it, it should be much better. It has to be good because it's the technology they're using to put lambdas into Java 8. So if they screw it up, they screw <coughs> Java 8. To the degree Java is an aura. Okay, it should be nasty. Good. Um, so overall, um, there's more than one way to run it. I think this is very much in the spirit of Perl. Um, so the big thing that we're doing different is instead of saying, well, we'll, you know, we'll have the official compiler and then you know, we'll have these other projects doing it on JVM, doing it on whatever, um, what we're saying is, well, we'll build Rakuto and we'll then have it run on multiple backends. So of course there's other ways. There's Nietzsche, which runs on CLR and it's a complete from scratch implementation. Um, but what we're really doing with Rakuto is we can say, well, we'll reuse most of the stuff and we'll run it on different Okay, so very last slide. Um, the vision, where I'd like us to get to in the course of maybe the next year or so. I'd like it if Perlsex runs nicely and reasonably quickly on a bunch of platforms so most tasks don't hit the speed thing. You can use the modules and the nice debugger, if you've seen that, okay, and all these different backends as well. And that most of the development work is not going into chasing and running on all of these different backends. It's actually on building the shared stuff that no matter what you run Rakuto on, um, it, it sort of helps. And that, one of the things that's really nice has been actually watching, and um, Liz has done loads of commits recently. Liz has been doing awesome stuff in Rakuto, but hasn't actually been building Rakuto on JVM. What's really nice is she hasn't actually broke Rakuto on JVM once yet while just testing it on Parrot. I think that says a lot about the abstraction <coughs> layer. Okay, I'm out of time, so I'd love to take questions, but I saw the end sign. Well, guys, I'm terribly sorry, but time's up, and uh, I think questions uh, would be better to ask during coffee break. Yep, so ask me in coffee break. All right, thanks very much.